Hello, dear friends. Today we will get acquainted with the memories of the Japanese pilot Izuka Tokuji. He fought as a naval dive bomber. His memoirs are remarkable as he talks about the attack on Pearl Harbor. In addition from his words, we can learn a lot of new and interesting things about the life of Japanese pilots and the Japanese army as a whole. The attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, was the culmination of a decade of deteriorating relations between the United States and the Empire of Japan. The relations between the states have gone bad primarily with the expansion of the Empire's territory in China. From the creation of the puppet state of Manchukuo, to the gradual spread of hostilities to the Second Sino-Japanese War to internal Chinese regions. However, diplomatic negotiations between the United States and Japan continued in Washington until the military attack. While diplomatic negotiations were ongoing, the Japanese came up with a plan that, in their opinion, would exclude the United States from a potential war in the Pacific. Naturally, the Japanese had no plans to conquer the United States. No one intended to invade American territory. The attack on Pearl Harbor was intended to destroy the United States Pacific Fleet. The idea was that while the Americans would rebuild the fleet, the Japanese would seize all American possessions, including the Philippines, and strengthen themselves there. If the Americans would like to recapture their possessions, a grueling war of attrition would start, and the Japanese came to the conclusion that the Americans, not wanting to spend a lot of money and a lot of resources, would leave that idea either. The Japanese were confident that their victory in Pearl Harbor would undermine American morale. That is why the destruction of the United States Pacific Fleet was Japan's priority. After all, it was these steel monsters that decided the fate of countries and empires in naval battles. The sponsor of this video, World of Warships, will help us feel the full power of sea monsters. Stunning graphics, more than 40 unique maps with dynamic weather, historically detailed ships from 10 countries, dynamic battles in the 12 vs 12 format, and much more will immerse you in the atmosphere of incredible naval battles of the Second World War. The free online game of World of Warships features battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and submarines. You are the captain, and you decide who you want to be. You can lie low with your aircraft carrier, as was done before the attack on Pearl Harbor, attack enemy ships from the depths of the sea like sea wolves in the Atlantic, or crush your enemies like the legendary Battle of Midway Atoll. If you haven't played World of Warships yet, don't worry, the game has an active and enthusiastic community. Join the gaming action, participate in discussions on the forums and Discord channel, tune into live streams, or compete in tournaments. Also, the game is available on consoles. All this will help you quickly adapt and find your path to glory. From the beginning of October, all active World of Warships players will have access to an exclusive Captain's Club, where players can receive discounts and offers from game partners such as Razor. Download World of Warships from the link in the video description. During registration, use the promo code BRAVO to receive a huge starter pack including 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account, and a ship. Immerse yourself in the atmosphere of naval battles with World of Warships, and if we meet in a battle, I hope we fight on the same side. Well now, let's get started. I began life in the northern part of Tochigi Prefecture, in a place called Otegahara in Nasu County, on January 13, 1920. I was the youngest of the seven brothers in my family, and all of us enlisted in the military. My six older brothers all went into the military so my father and mother wished strongly that I, at least, would not go into the military. My six brothers served in the army, and it was a wonder that not one of us was killed during the war. I had no special reason I could think of in planning for my career other than the wish to fly an airplane and wear the navy uniform, which I thought looked much sharper than the army's. One uniform was white and the other was a black one with pleats and a dangling short dagger. That is about all for my so-called motivation to volunteer for the Navy. The day before my enlistment, the family went to Inoshima to spend the night together, and the next day, June 1, 1937, I entered the Navy at the Yokosuka Chinjufu or Naval District. I was still wearing my middle school uniform and carrying two or three books with me. I had joined the Navy during my fourth grade of the old middle school system, which is comparable to the second year of the present high school. Those living in Hokkaido, Tokohu, 
and the present Kanto Koshinetsu districts came under the jurisdiction of Yokosuka Jinjufu, and all were inducted there. On July 7th of that year, the so-called Marco Polo Bridge incident broke out. It was the first step leading up to that big war. To us in the Navy, however, we had no way of then knowing of such things. I had enlisted in the Japanese Navy Air Corps at Yokosuka in 1937, completed flight training, and by early 1940, I had become a dive bomber pilot. After getting some practical training at Usa and Omura Air Squadrons, I was dispatched to the Battle Theater Squadron in Shanghai toward the end of 1940. At the time, I was still a greenhorn. I was assigned to pilot an old Aichi Type 96 biplane dive bomber. My duty was to be on the lookout for enemy movement at the front of our Army ground units, preparing to advance. In 1941, I received orders to return to Japan. I thought then that I could take it easy for a while. Upon arriving in Japan, however, I found myself posted to the aircraft carrier Akagi, and in April, I reported for duty. As a flight crew member of the Akagi, I engaged in dive bombing practices at Yokosuka and Kagoshima. The air groups of the various fleet carriers carried out training in consort. In mid-November, we were all ordered to return to our carriers. Immediately after all the planes had landed, our carriers began to leave port. When Seiki Bay passed out of sight, we were told for the first time that we were headed for a mission in the Hawaiian Island area. Shortly after, the Akagi entered Hitokapu Bay of Iturufu Island, and we joined up with the other five carriers, the Kirishima, our escort battleship, as well as other vessels. After departing Hitokapu Bay, we headed east and sailed in waters out of range of enemy scout planes based at Midway and Hawaii. En route, we received instructions from the combined fleet to climb Mount Nitaka. It meant that U.S.-Japan negotiations had broken down, and therefore, it was for us to attack Pearl Harbor. At last, we felt the time for us had come to take the plunge. On December 8th, the wake-up call was made at zero hours. We prayed in front of the Akagi Shrine, as did the crewmen of the Kaga and the other carriers in front of their respective shrines. After lining up our planes on deck, we flew off the Akagi. My plane was in the second wave attack squadron, so it was only after the first wave had taken off that we were able to take to the air. Originally, the attack would have been more effective if the first and second waves had gone together. However, due to the characteristics of our carriers, it was not possible to fly off all 70 planes on the Akagi and the other carriers at one time, so it was decided to attack in two waves. At the time of takeoff, the weather was quite stormy. The carriers were rolling considerably, pitching and yawing. Under such conditions, it was very difficult to carry out takeoff operations. On attack missions, our planes carried full tank loads of fuel. Dive bombers would each carry a 250-kilogram bomb, while the attack planes each carried a torpedo weighing 800 kilograms, or an equivalent bomb load. So the instant the plane left the flight deck, some would sink out of sight and then come up and fly away. Despite the stormy weather, however, all planes managed to leave the carriers and there was not one plane that plunged into the ocean on takeoff. Once in the air, we assembled in a formation with fighter planes at the front, followed by the carrier attack planes and then the carrier bombers. In such a formation, each group flew about 20 to 30 meters higher than the unit in front to avoid the propeller turbulence. Sitting in my plane, flying at the very rear of the formation, was like sitting in a seat at the rear of a staircase classroom and looking down. About one hour after takeoff, my observer, Kawai, in the rear cockpit received a signal, All planes attack! It was from the commander of the first wave, Lieutenant Commander Fuchida Mitsuo. I felt then that this signal meant our attack was a success. The flights to Hawaii took about two hours. At about that time, Oahu Island should have been seen, but heavy clouds had closed in, and this made me worry a bit. Just then there was a break in the clouds, and I could see Oahu below. How can I express this moment in words? Good luck was coming our way, I felt. The standing order for dive bomber squadrons was to go after enemy aircraft carriers only. The standing order for dive bomber squadrons was to go after enemy aircraft carriers only. That day, however, the American carriers were not there, so we proceeded to bomb the battleships instead. The 250-kilogram bombs carried by the dive bombers could not cause any serious damage to battleships, except perhaps we might be able to inflict some damage to the top structure. Piercing 30-centimeter-thick deck armor was asking for too much. 
so we were told to drop our bombs directly into the funnel, which proved to be a very difficult thing to do, perhaps an impossible task, I believe. We knew from our intelligence which vessels would be in the harbor, which vessels had left, and other movements up to about December 1st. All this information was being gathered daily by a former graduate of the Naval Academy posted at our Consul General's office in Hawaii. He had entrenched himself in a second-floor room of an Oahu restaurant overlooking the harbor and reported daily on ship movements in the harbor, what ships departed, what ships entered, and so on, while sipping sake. And by observing U.S. naval exercises closely for many years, we learned that Navy vessels tended to gather in the harbor in greatest numbers at this time. Thus, the attack date was chosen. A considerable number of battleships and cruisers had gathered there. However, the two expected aircraft carriers could not be seen in the harbor. Because of political tensions, we later learned, the two aircraft carriers had sailed out of Pearl Harbor to transfer airplanes to Wake and Midway Islands. When we arrived over Oahu, the attack by the first wave had already achieved very effective results. Warships in the harbor and aircraft on the airfields were fiercely burning, with smoke rising all over. Furthermore, when we arrived, enemy anti-aircraft guns and machine guns had already opened fire on us. This was supposed to be a surprise attack, but it felt to me like a head-on assault. But before takeoff for the mission, our approach route had already been decided on, as were the targets for the attack bombers and dive bombers. I started my dive, aiming at the third battleship in the inner row of the battleships lined up in two rows. Those on the outer side of the two rows were for the torpedo planes to attack. Since the torpedoes could not reach the battleships in the inner row, it was the job of the bombers to undertake. As I mentioned earlier, while diving toward my target below, my bomb sight became filled up with red color of enemy machine gun fire aimed at my plane. It was like a stick of fireworks going off. Taking aim through my bomb sight filled with the red fireworks, I dropped my bomb at an altitude of 400 meters and began my pullout. My bomb hit the target. It was recorded as a hit, but what battleship it was that I hit is not known. After all, this being my first battle, I had been wholly concentrated on getting my job done well and not these other fine details. Incidentally, I would like to touch on a happening, which later became a humorous matter. The dive bomber used at the time of the attack on Hawaii was the two-seater Type 99 Kambaku. My observer, Kawai Yuyu, from Kasama Ibaragi Prefecture, was in the rear cockpit. As we made the steep dive toward our target, Kawai read off the altitude and cried out, Tay! signifying release bomb. When I pulled up, Kawai was still shouting, Tay! 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 Later, I asked him why he had let out such a cry. He told me that the detachable ammo magazine dropped off from the machine gun due to the G-force at pull-up and hit him hard on the leg. He then thought for sure he had been hit by enemy fire, and so he decided to cry out, Tenoheka, or Emperor, Banzai. But he could only cry out, Tay! 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 repeating only the first syllable of the word Emperor. As a matter of fact, I was also in a similar state of excitement as my comrade in the rear cockpit. It was our first combat experience, and so we both must have been quite jittery. Kawai was later lost in action in the air battle over the Solomons. A well-matched pilot and observer acting as one are ideal, and such a pair makes a good team for dive-bombing missions. However, months later in the Solomons, Kawai flew off in a plane with a different pilot and was killed. Over Pearl, we both must have been tense, but on the other hand, somewhat cool. After bombing the battleship in the harbor, we looked down on Ford Island, and strafed an airfield nearby as instructed. After that, we retreated toward the sea off the Honolulu coast. There, we circled and waited for the others to show up. We were followed and attacked by an enemy P-40 fighter plane. On Oahu, there were several airfields such as Hickam and Wheeler, and there were many fighter planes there. These planes were the first to be attacked by the first wave, so that no fighters could fly up to intercept us. The carrier bombers from the Shokaku and Zuikaku, which participated in the first wave attack, had bombed the airfields. The carrier bombers of the Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu of the first air fleet had received superior training, so they were instructed to attack the vessels in the harbor. The training level of the crews on the carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku was somewhat less than the other four carriers. Therefore, they had been assigned the airfields as targets. It turned out that one airfield, a small one near to Wheeler, was left untouched. So when the second wave arrived, these P-40s, about ten undamaged ones, came up to intercept us. Pilot Goto Jen, in the Akagi dive bomber group, 
and who had participated in the attack with us engaged one of these P-40s in an air duel. Both ended up shooting each other down off Honolulu. The enemy plane went down and so did ours. Because we had observed this air duel, both were credited as having been shot down. About two years ago, a part of the plane piloted by Goto was salvaged out of the ocean. Author Henmi Jun wrote in her book that the piece found was identified as being from the Goto plane. While continuing to circle, our Shotai leader alerted us that fuel was spurting out from our wing tank. While engaged in the dive bombing, I had heard a knock-knock sound, which must have been the noise of enemy machine gun bullets hitting our plane. At the time, we did not know of this, but we noticed the damage later. Looking at the spots where the bullets hit, they appeared to have been made by a 7.7mm machine gun. If they had been from a 13mm gun, we probably would not have been able to fly. My wing petrol tank had taken three bullet hits. When I first noticed this, fuel was already leaking out in fairly big spurts. It had to be coped with just right. I thought of making an emergency landing at the pre-appointed place. However, we decided to fly back alone without waiting for the others to form up. The Type 99 dive bomber could keep flying for about eight hours after takeoff. In the case of the attack on Hawaii, the one-way flight had taken a bit longer than two hours. Given the 30 minutes used over Hawaii, it meant we could safely spend slightly less than five hours in order to return to our carrier. So we should have had at least two hours of fuel to spare. Therefore, as mentioned before, we had taken three machine gun bullet hits in the wing tank and the fuel was spurting out. So what I did then was to open up the fuel valve to the leaking wing tank. By doing so, the engine sucked the fuel from the leaking tank to some extent, thus slowing the rate of leak. This procedure, I hoped, would also compensate for some of the fuel leaking by diverting some to be consumed by the engine. This proved to be an effective emergency measure. Even under normal conditions, getting back to the carrier itself would have been no easy task. We would have been flying around four hours after takeoff. In the meantime, the carriers themselves could have moved away over a hundred kilometers. Of course, for security reason, we could not use our wireless for help. So, in short, getting back depended more or less on guesswork. After flying off the carrier, the first thing we had to do was to calculate the distance to Hawaii. By flying at cruising speed, it would take close to two hours to get there. Before takeoff, we were briefed as to what direction, in degrees, the carriers would go after our takeoff. We did not take notes of this on our air chart, so that the enemy would not be able to know the carrier's position should we have been shot down and the maps recovered by the enemy. We were then to make our own navigation calculations and determine the destination of our carriers six hours after flying us off. In doing this, we always included the drift in our calculation. Unless we first calculated the wind speed at a certain height and at certain degrees, a big miscalculation could have been made. We also had to make a drift calculation by taking a look at the surface of the ocean in order to judge the strength and direction of the wind. This is common knowledge. When flying over land, the smoke from a chimney teaches us a very good lesson about the wind. In order to help us with our navigation, the fleet would have destroyers placed several kilometers apart, in our case, about 50 kilometers away from the carrier. There was one of our submarines on the surface with a white cloth on it, resembling an ordinary sail. This would show us the way back to the task force's position. What a relief it was when we saw that submarine! We were teenagers of 19 then, and had flown over five hours to return without losing our way. Even now, I wonder how we ever made it back. As I mentioned before, in the attack on Pearl Harbor, 29 planes of our side failed to return, including the four dive bombers from the Akagi. The Goto aircraft was confirmed as lost in a dogfight with an enemy plane, both planes having shot each other down. It is not known what happened to the other three dive bombers and where they were lost, so they were only reported missing. Perhaps they could not locate their carriers. On return to the Akagi, we made an emergency landing. Landing on a carrier is hard to imagine. As each plane returns, one after another, it must be landed without delay. There were three elevators to lower the planes to their hangars below. While one plane was being lowered, but before it was stored in its hangar, the next plane landed. A barricade had to be set up on deck to prevent the plane that was landing from running into the plane in front of it. In my case, the wing hit this barricade and the body folded up, dog-legged, at the spot where the Hinomaru is painted. Both Kawai and I got out without a scratch, but our plane was no longer usable. 
The fuselage must have also taken some bullet hits, and it had weakened the part where the bullets had entered. This plane, nevertheless, was taken back to Iwakuni in as-is condition. The dive bomber had proven to be a highly expendable airplane. Out of all the air losses at Pearl Harbor, there were a total of 14 dive bombers lost from our wave. Not so long ago, American and Japanese soldiers were gathering in Hawaii, and I was taken to the very place where one of our planes crashed. The place is located at one side of the present airport and marked by a small stone memorial. It was well kept with bougainvillea flowers growing here and there. It was explained to me that the first memorial was erected, not after the war, but in December 1941, right at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. The remains of the pilot were placed in a box with the stars and stripes, not the Hinomaru Japanese flag draped over it. Then it was quietly lowered into the grave as a bugler played in tribute. Even a photograph was taken of this event. That such a ceremony was undertaken during wartime was an act the Japanese would hardly ever have thought of doing. That's all for today. If you want to delve into the atmosphere of amazing naval battles, then play World of Warships. Follow the link in the pinned comment and in the video description. During registration, use the code BRAVO to receive 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account, and a ship for free. Happy hunting, Captain!